Uh, my name is uh, unpronounceable. <laughs> it's probably the most difficult thing you'll come across today, which is why everybody calls me Oggy, including my wife and kids. Uh, I'm undergraduate admissions tutor in a school of the best engineering in the world. Uh, and I also teach undergraduate students. I teach first year, first semester, circuit analysis. My slides are mostly about what electrical and electronic engineering is, and I don't go into what we as a department offer in particular. So I'm just going to quickly mention a few of the points. And one of the most important points I make to people like you is you don't have to love soldering in order to do electrical and electronic engineering. I never enjoyed it very much. I did it for one semester, and I hopefully I'll never do it again. You don't have to be able to do any kind of uh, decomposition of the rad radio and reassembly of it either. You need to be very good at maths. That's the most important thing for us. Our entry requirements are such that you could be doing mathematics and then further mathematics and then history, and you would be fine coming to study with us. So you don't have to do A level in electronics in order to do electrical and electronic engineering. OK. so. The, this is sort of a, the slide that you wouldn't think I would have when I'm talking about electrical and electronic engineering. I have a Formula One car, I have a, a Eurofighter, I've got some robots, a mobile phone, and a medical instrument. I could have had a, a wind turbine, I could have had a nuclear reactor, I could have had a refinery. What do all these things have in common? What does a Eurofighter and a toaster have in common? They wouldn't work without electrical and electronic engineering. The, in case of the Eurofighter, which is actually open loop and stable system, it would just fall out of the sky if you switch off all the electronic control systems on board. People say Eurofighter flies because of the computer. It's not just the computer that keeps the Eurofighter flying. You have a sensors communicating to the computers, communicating to the actuators, and together they make this thing work. I've struggled for about five years to come, to come in a succinct form to explain what electrical and electronic engineering is to people like you. And I come up with a very flamboyant statement that some of my colleagues might not appreciate. And that is, what other engineers build, we make intelligent. <laughs> so when people said, how do you solve the problem of how many people come on a bus? The solution is, you buy a sensor which detects how many people come on the bus and how many people come off the bus. You communicate that information to a little computer which costs about 50p. You can't run uh, PlayStation <coughs> games on it. But it will count the number of people counting it up and counting it down. And then wirelessly communicating that information seamlessly to some center that is 50 kilometers away. All of that happens without any problem. That's what electronic and electrical engineering is about. What nervous system is to you, that's what electrical and electronic engineering is to planes, trains, cars, nuclear reactors, refineries, any kind of modern engineering system or device you can think of. What other engineers build, we make intelligent. There is another word for intelligent, an adjective. Instead of intelligent, they say smart. Smartphone, smart car, smart home, smart meter, smart bridge, smart anything. What does a smart car mean? Smart car is a car that can drive itself. It can't drive itself. It has electronic control system on board, which has sensors that are detecting where the adjacent objects are and makes continuous adjustments so it appears as though the car is driving itself. You go to the modern refineries, nuclear, en uh, sorry, chemical engineering example. You won't find 500 operators running around like blue ass flies, checking the uh, sensor information, opening and closing valves. There will be five of them in a control room for uh, emergency shutdowns and grade changes because most of the time, Electronic control systems are running the show, measuring all these variables and making adjustments. So electrical and electronic engineering is absolutely everywhere. One of the problems that we have is you don't have wires sticking out of these things. So you don't appreciate just how much of it is there in all of these different devices and systems. OK, uh, so it's a very, very fascinating field, but it's also highly employable. Because not many people are thinking of doing electrical and electronic engineering. How many of you had put yourselves down for one of the workshops in electrical and electronic engineering? OK, good, excellent, fabulous. <laughs> normally, normally, majority of the people who like maths or physics go on to study maths or physics. So those that think of engineering usually decide on one generic one, for example, mechanical engineering. And by the time they come to electrical and electronic, and they're not liking soldiering very much, everybody's gone home. 
So as far as electrical and electronic engineering is concerned, it's a very, very highly employable profession. You go out there with a first class honors degree from a good university, you will have no problem getting a job, even a higher second class. In case of the electrical power systems, which is where electrical engineering comes in. What is electrical engineering? Electrical engineering is about generating electricity, transporting that electricity by speed of light effectively, and transforming it to other forms at the other end of the country, a continent, or the world. So the light that we are consuming here now might have been converted from the sunlight in sunny Spain milliseconds ago and transported to us and transformed here into the lovely light. So that's electrical engineering. Uh, in case of electrical engineering, there is a huge new opportunity coming in with these things called smart grids. I don't know if you've heard of smart grids. This is all about renewable energy, integrating renewable energy, electric vehicles. Everybody produces a bit of electricity and sends it back to the, to the network. And all of that is lovely and nice, but the problem, and there is a lot of money involved with it. I put this number here. It's 200 billion pounds. And I write it like this because it gives you an idea of how big the number is. Uh, but there is a big but. And what is the big but? The big but is that the majority of those who are currently employed in this industry will retire within the next 15 years. And they will require 2,000 new electrical and electronic engineers every year for the next 20 years to replenish that. Because when we're talking about new renewable energy, about the wind farms in the North Sea, and how do we integrate them, that's where electrical engineering comes in, as well as civil engineering. I'm pushing electrical here, and you understand why. Um, this is not just the case with electrical. If you look at the electronics industry, there's going to be a huge explosion of electronic industry. And growth is predicted of about 50% by 2020, with a generation of up to 150,000 jobs by 2020. So one thing is it's a cool field, but it's also highly employable. And uh, coming back, coming to the slide that Ian nicely stole away from me. There is a third component of happiness with electrical and electronic engineering. And that is you do not know what you will be doing when you come to be my age. So this is the picture of that mobile phone that Ian mentioned before. It, it was like a brick and you need a bag full of batteries that will last you half an hour. And it was just a phone. There was no internet then. You look at something that we have these days in 2015. Now I think this is not a phone anymore. This is my best new friend. If there is one thing my wife is jealous of, it's this. And I don't really talk to anybody on this. I don't probably even text that much people anymore. This is my MP3 player. This is my camera. This is my GPS device. This is my plane spotting app uh, device. This is anything a boy ever wanted to have. And this is what we managed to get in 30 years as we go from 85, not even 85. 15 years ago, they were not that far away from this. And who knows what the future holds? Who knows what the future holds? And with all the other engineering disciplines, who knows what the future holds because they will have more sophisticated electronic control systems on board that will automate their processes and make them even smarter. And then when we look at electrical power systems, now when I was doing electrical engineering, this is what everybody thought of electrical engineering. Dirty old big transformers and generators. Why would you ever want to do anything like that? But now, all of a sudden, everybody's talking about renewable energy. Everybody's got PV. People want electric vehicles, smart meters, blah, 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 blah. And we need to sustain this revolution that's going to happen because we, have to sur we can't survive without electricity. I say to people, you, we can live without water. But I don't want to try it out for seven days. How long can civilization survive without electricity if we just lost all the power supply? All the banks lost all the power supply, all the data just disappeared. I don't want to think about that. So it's very, very critical to what we do. So uh, to finish it off, uh, I'll give you an example of what I mean by other engineers building and us making intelligent. I'll show you my favorite toy, which is called Mini Oggy. Because I take it everywhere and I show it to everybody. Sorry, Kevin. So this is a device. Uh, let's assume it's designed by mechanical engineers. <laughs> but it's not designed particularly well. It's actually what we call open loop unstable, like a bicycle or a Eurofighter at supersonic speeds. I, uh, you guys are uh, old enough to realize this. But when I go to primary schools, I tell them I'll give you 1,000 pounds if you make it stand on its own for 15 seconds. And they get very enthusiastic about it. Obviously, you can't. Obviously, you can't. 
Uh, however, if you turn on electronic control system, all of a sudden this thing is able to, hopefully, you never know, be able to actually stand up on its own and even interact with its environment. So what he's doing is he's continuously measuring the angle at which he's tilting. He's got a, or she, sorry, might be a lady, uh, a gyro sensor. And a gyro sensor is detecting whether it's leaning forwards or backwards. Communicates that information to a computer, like a microcomputer, which then calculates appropriate com compensating signal and sends that signal to the actuator. This is the principle that you can apply to any other engineering system. You have a sensor that detects the environment in which the system finds itself, communicates that information to the brain, and then brain makes appropriate adjustments. You do that all the time. When somebody throws a ball at you, you're not calculating differential equations. Thank you very much for the catch. You're not calculating differential equations and thinking, oh, all right, I need to move that. You're constantly looking at where the ball is and making adjustments. That's exactly how modern control systems work. And when we start making the life a bit of a misery, no problem. And on that note, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you.